Thank you very much. Oh. Oh. Whew. This was gripping. And thank you so much, Amber, for being so brave that you would share your personal story. This is the, the topic that we have to deal with. And while it's very hard to follow such a powerful experience that Amber was surely not planning on, it is something that we have to face. We're in our fifth year where the income from farming and ranching is equal to or exceeded by the expenses. And we're seeing an increase in people ending their lives. How terribly difficult it is for us to understand what Amber and her family has gone through. Even more difficult is what Chris went through. We have to start somewhere, and I commend you the extension and thank Andrea for making this summit possible so that we begin to face the questions that are so troubling and for which we don't have good enough answers. Yes, we know more, and that is my task here, to try to share the research underpinnings of what is known. But there's more that's not known, and it's clear from Amber's experience and her loss that there are more questions than good answers yet. Yes, we do have some federal buy-in finally with the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network. I will be talking more about that tomorrow. What I hope to mostly do here today is to present what we do know, as well as many of the unanswered questions. I would like to take your questions as we go along, rather than to have you wait to the end, because it's more important that we answer your questions than it is those which I surmise we need to answer. Every circumstance, every place is different. Every one of you is different in here. Every person who ends his or her life has a different set of circumstances, and we can't judge. It is important that we not use the word commit suicide. It is not an act of commission. It's an act of surrender from what we know. We cannot judge what is in the minds of persons who have fought a brave battle and couldn't come up with adequate answers to keep going. But we have to tackle this very painful subject just like we have to understand better the stresses that affect agricultural producers everywhere. I just came here from Farm Aid in eastern Wisconsin. The concert was wonderful, but even more wonderful was the interaction of the attendees, mostly farmers and ranchers. It was the most activist group that I have seen since the farm crisis of the 1980s. My role was with the American Psychological Association, which partnered with Farm Aid for the first time to sponsor the Farm Aid concert and activities. And I think that said something. It could be any other organization. It could be extension. It could be professional behavioral health counselors, social workers. We're all in this together to figure out better solutions to the unknown questions 
unanswered questions. The discussion and the meetings before the concert were very, very meaningful as people told their stories of trying to make farming more profitable, but most importantly, more rewarding psychologically and financially. It was a comfort to see so many people there, 36,000. It was absolutely wonderful to listen to the musicians and to get to know some of them a little bit. Yes, Willie came on. It was midnight before he started. It was 2.30 before we got to bed and we had to leave eastern Wisconsin and drive yesterday through 450 miles of rain before we got to dry weather in western uh, Minnesota and into the Dakotas. See, you guys are doing something right out here. It was clear. <laughs> that experience in many ways gave me courage to move forward with this kind of a conference where we have more questions than answers, but we have to start somewhere. We will learn about the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network. It is derived from research and support programs that were ongoing from 1999 to 2014 and still in some ways are ongoing. So the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network is not the end all answer. It's just a step in the right direction. And it is $10 million for each of five years, not billion, I wish it were billion. We need that kind of commitment to get the answers and the supports that are needed. I thank Andrea for that wonderful introduction. I might say that my life in this arena began shortly before the farm crisis of the 1980s. Marilyn, my wife, and I were professors at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. I had grown up on a farm in western Iowa. Marilyn grew up in Idaho of Japanese-American farmer in ancestry. We always wanted to raise our children on a farm, so after five years at the University of Virginia, we left to move to a farm in western Iowa near family so our children could attend the excellent schools that we have in the Midwest. Little did we know that the farm crisis was to begin two years after we left Charlottesville. We arrived just in time to begin to try to provide assistance to troubled people and to try to figure out some answers. So I've been at this for 40 years and we've made a little bit of progress, but not enough. Please do take those articles that were sent uh, and have been duplicated for you or Andrea have if not duplicated are they online somebody knows okay and yes great wonderful if you have need to contact me uh, feel free to email me first uh, I am so busy right now that I have to request that you email me first and then we can try to set up a time to talk if that becomes necessary. We will look at today why farming is so terribly stressful. What do we know about the stresses? What don't we know? How does the behavioral health of farm and ranch residents, farm workers, 
migrant laborers, how does our behavioral health differ from the general population? Are these differences due to the fact that we are working the land and taking care of water and air and using these vital resources to produce essentials for life? How does that perhaps set us up to be different from the rest of the population? Why do we farm? given the difficult finances and the troubling stresses. So we'll look at that. We'll mostly look at the underlying reasons for stress and why we are having this conference today and concentrate more tomorrow on solutions and you'll find many answers in the breakout sessions as well. Let's begin with behavioral well-being and why is it important for healthy food production. Notice that I've used the word behavior rather than mental and I do that for good reason. The term has become the acceptable term at the federal level since April of 2006. It was rural people who moved the dial when we met to formulate a rural mental health strategic plan in Jackson Hole, Wyoming in May 2005. It was then called the Rural Mental Health Summit. Several of us said the word mental doesn't fit well. We say about people derogatorily, oh, you're mental. But behavior is a term that is more acceptable, especially to farm and ranch people who understand the behavior of cattle, horses, swine, sheep, the more we know about their behavior, the more we can utilize that knowledge to improve their growth rate and their productiveness in dairies. There are learnings from animals that apply to us as humans as well. So when we use the word behavior, it does not stigmatize. It is not mysterious. It is something that we have control over, unlike so many of the other factors that Amber so clearly described, and which Governor Rounds and uh, Brad Rasmussen also mentioned. So behavior also looks at a range of solution givers or helpers. It includes anybody who impacts our behavior, which means that lenders must have some knowledge about behavioral well-being now. We are seeing behavior integrated into curricula in ways that we never could have imagined. The science of behavior psychology is only a hundred years or so old. Unlike chemistry and physics, which are two to three centuries older, we are behind, but we can measure how frequently we cry or pray or laugh, how intensely the tears flow, and whether they're tears of happiness and joy or sorrow and loss. We can control our behaviors more than we can control the weather, government policy, and other factors that impinge on our lives. So if possible, don't use the word commit and use the word behavior as much as possible. 
we're seeing whole departments change their names from psychiatry to the Department of Behavioral Health. It includes the whole person, our mind, body, and spirit. It includes a range of solutions from those offered by professionals in the behavioral health field, social work, behavioral health therapy, psychology, advanced nurse practice, pastoral counseling, but it also includes substance misuse counseling, the work of extension personnel to help people figure out how to manage our finances, our behaviors more productively. It includes the efforts of agronomists, and the time is coming when we will see behavior integrated into genetic knowledge in the new field called behavioral genetics or behavioral bioinformatics. My son-in-law has his PhD in behavioral bioinformatics and has devised a number of the tests that look at the human genome and to figure out the site on the human genome where depression originates and anxiety disorders and so forth. So we're making small steps, even though we have a ways to go. What are some of the contributors to stress? Well, they're up here in print, but they vary for every person and situation. Those stressors that affect agricultural producers the most are those beyond our control. The most important stressors are those we can't control, and as Amber in indicated, financial stress was a major factor. So was the planting season, which brought into Chris and Amber's thinking, are we going to make enough this year that we can service our loan or loans? We know that financial threats are at the top of the list of stressors for farmers. You'll see in this first set of slides that threatened loss of the land is the most potent stressor for agricultural producers, whether it's ranch land or farmland, or if you're fishers or foresters, forest terrain, or boats. The USDA definition of farmer, as everybody in the extension knows, includes all producers of food and fiber. So that includes hunters and fishers and foresters as well as workers, migrant laborers, ranchers, farmers. What we also know is that after the threatened loss of any of those important resources needed to farm, that is the land, but it can also be our equipment, our livestock, our facilities, our human capital or labor, our financial underpinnings. Any threats to those necessities to farm successfully make us hyper alert and overreact. Now we're at a point where uncertainty is greater than it has been for a long time because of our foreign trade relationships. We're not sure whether the renewable fuel standard will allow small individual cooperatives that produce ethanol to remain viable. We don't know if we'll get back our markets to China. Yes, dairy's finally improved a little bit, but it's going to take three years of prices for milk, well above the cost to produce that milk, to dig out of a long hole that has occurred for eight of the past nine years. We can't control changing consumer preferences. 
So not only are farmers distressed, but our whole rural, rural communities dependent on agriculture are stressed. Much of what we heard at Farm Aid were questions about why don't corporate entities that support farming do a more to help? It's a good question. I don't know the answer. Let's look a little bit at some of the good news about the behavioral well-being of agricultural producers. When we compare our current recession, which is the worst since the farm crisis of the 1980s, with the highest rate of suicide since the 1980s, especially in those areas that do not have support programs. It is also the worst rate of bankruptcies and foreclosures since the 1980s. But there's a lot of good news. The good news is that we have not lost nearly as many farmers and ranchers as we did in the 1980s. During that difficult era, 20% of all agricultural producers had to cease production. There is an ongoing, continual consolidation of agriculture, as everybody knows, with farms getting larger if they are conventional operators. Simultaneously, and I think this is part of the good news, we are seeing the emergence of many small operations, often which are regenerative or sustainable. That is, they try to put necessities back into the soil and the water that are needed to produce food, like fertilizer in the form of manure or fodder from plants or cover crops. We're seeing people shift in these productive ways of managing land. We're seeing more and more organic farmers emerge and who farm small parcels ranging from an acre up to maybe several hundred acres. We visited a farm, farmer I should say, in Wisconsin who manages 5,000 acres of organic farmland. So we are seeing some good things. There's a whole generation emerging that wants to take over farming. It's not as bad as what many of us think that our sons and daughters don't want to farm because it's too stressful or they don't have the capital to get started. There are enough programs now around to help farmers begin that sources of credit are more readily available than they were in the 1980s. Some other good features about today are that we have services to keep people around, mediation, farm crisis helplines and hotlines, which I'll say more about, ag safety and health programs that sprung up in the 90s, we have reduced the death rate from physical causes of fatality on the farm. When I say farm, I am including ranch. We have reduced them by half. Child deaths on the farm have decreased even more. But we have not improved the rate of caring for people with psychological stressors or injuries. And that's the part that we have to address. The rate has continued up. We have better understanding of behavioral health than we ever had. I think it's partly because of the media, which have done superb work. You can't pick up a farm or ranching magazine without it having at least one article about farm stress or behavioral health problems on the farm or ranch and what to do about them. So the knowledge of 
behavioral health has just grown by leaps and bounds. Farm people are much more open than they have been in the past to reaching out for help. Chris and Amber certainly did that. It wasn't enough. That is the gnawing question. What else is needed? But we have better resources now than what we had in terms of understanding that we can manage our behavior. Let me give an illustration. Research in Sweden was undertaken of dairy operators and workers and also feedlot operators and workers. When the operators and workers rated their mental or psychological well-being as troubled, they had a much higher rate of veterinary visits to the farm operation. The most distressed farmers had the highest somatic cell counts in their dairy milk, more mastitis. When farm workers felt that they were included or valued in the operation, their adaptations and adjustments improved. So the communication between the managers and the workers was a key factor in improving their behavioral well-being, not only for the workers, employees, but also for the managers. Happy managers make happy employees and happy cows. You don't have to go to California to find happy cows. So, it is important for us to know that when we are tense, probably it's going to affect the quality of our decision making on the farm and ranch, and it's going to impact how able we are to focus our full attention on the farm and ranch operation. When we learn how to manage our behavioral health, it's a step in the right direction. I have found that people in my neighboring towns cut out the farm articles and they take them during the winter months for coffee and they talk about them over coffee. Who could have imagined that a generation ago? Farmers talking about their behavioral health? Wow. So they don't just have to talk about how many snowdrifts they drove through to get there. I think it is important also to know that farmers and ranchers now hug each other. In my depression support group for farmers and ranchers, when they see each other, they bump chest, we give each other a hug. There are tears from men and they talk openly about what they don't understand and why they are depressed. Who could have imagined that 25 years ago? That doesn't mean everybody does, but we, got, we have improved a lot. Yes? We have been holding it uh, in my office until I close my office down, sometimes in church facilities, in a room in the library, sometimes in a room in the back of the bank, uh, any place that, even the back room of a restaurant. Uh, it just needs to be a neutral site, and it's okay now for farmers to park their cars out front. They do. It was especially nice that I had my office in a flower shop because when people parked in front of the flower shop, they could have been going in to buy roses for their spouses or whatever. Uh, or they could have been coming down to see me. Talking about roses. In, on February 13 this year, Marilyn and I were heading to 
Little Rock, Arkansas, where I was to speak to the Arkansas Farm Bureau. On our way down, we decided let's go a day early and spend some time at Hot Springs National Park. We decided to see if we could get a room at the resort there, the old, old resort that's almost 100 years old. We called them and they said, you know, for another $150, we can give you the Valentine's Day special. And I thought about that, realized that Marilyn and I have been married for 47 years. It was about time to celebrate it. So we said, yep, we'll spring for it. We get to the room and here's rose petals put all over the bed, red roses in a vase, chocolate covered strawberries, Owls folded up like two swans that are facing each other, shaped like a heart. Marilyn has to take pictures and send them to our two children. First, my son responded. He says, Mom, are you sure this is Dad? This isn't the Dad that I know. <laughs> and to add to my misery, our daughter said, usually you just buy her another vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Well, they know what the real story is. They grew up on our farm. They're both back in Iowa, finally. More about stressors. We know that the loss of, or threatened loss of the land or assets needed to farm are at the top of the stress list, but not too far behind are the loss of a child in a farming event. When the child is deceased in a farming event, we can't get away from the scene. Or when a person ends his or her life, we can't get away from the scene because we live on that place. It makes it hard for us. Imagine how hard it made it for the person who ended his or her life. We know also that after the death of a child, there is loss of hope that the farm will pass on to another generation of operators. After they, the threatened or the loss of a child is equal to the loss of a farm at the top of the list. They are followed by, in third place, the loss of an important contributor to the farm operation. It can be a spouse, could be a father, maybe a valued employee. Fourth is the loss of a spouse in death, especially when it's unexpected through something like a crash or when it's even expected like cancer, heart disease, and so forth. Fifth is divorce. And right close to divorce is machinery breakdowns, disease outbreaks, inclement weather, 6th, 7th, 8th. It is interesting that divorce is as high as 5th, but I think it is that high because the solutions to divorce often involve separating out the property, which leads to a great deal of strife in many troubling relationships. So there is this good news about farming that we manage our stress better. But let me talk a little bit more about the American Farm Bureau Federation poll done by Morning Consult in April this year somewhat over 2,000 rural residents of the United States were selected to represent all rural residents. Remember that rural people comprise 17% of the U.S. population. That is, people who live in communities under 10,000 and on the farms or ranches or smaller villages. So the vast majority of Americans 
83% are suburban or metro. But we rural people have much importance because we are the source of the food. We're also the source of important substances that are needed for uh, minerals, metals, wood, and so forth. It intrigued me how native people at Farm Aid talked about the importance of water. Water is medicine. We need to take care of our water and our soil. They are gifts from God. They are all around us. God is all around us. Mother Earth is with us. Air, water, land. The American Farm Bureau poll showed that 30% of farmers said poor mental health, and I use the word mental here because that was what they used, is a major problem for them or their workers. At times past, they probably would not have said that. 48% of rural residents said they are experiencing more mental health challenges than a year ago, with younger persons feeling the most vulnerable. 31% of farm residents sought assistance while 21% of farmers and farm workers sought outside assistance. That's an improvement from the farm crisis era where we had to take services to people and to find them at farm auctions or when they were referred by court or in some cases by spouses. During the farm crisis of the 1980s, 65% of the callers seeking assistance were women. It has completely reversed. Now, to our hotlines and helplines, 58% of first-time callers are men. Who could have imagined? It is a step in the right direction to have your Avera farm and ranch stress line. But you have many more than that here in South Dakota. Catholic Family Services, Lutheran Social Services, a community support system, pastors. We have to depend on our nurse practitioners and physicians. But most of all, we have to depend on each other. And it's important that this conference is bringing together people to be exposed to mental health first aid training. Another thing that the American Farm Bureau Federation poll showed is that 82% of farm residents said their mental health is important to them or their family. Ninety-one percent of farmers and farm workers said financial issues and fear of losing their farm impact their mental health. Amber knows all about that. It says, indeed, that this list of stressors correctly identifies the threatened loss of the land at the top of the financial stressors or the top of the stress list. Stigma, cost, and lack of access to competent health are major factors for not seeking health. help. The number of Psychiatrist and psychologist per 100,000 persons in South Dakota rural areas is half that of urban areas. Where do our professionals locate in our state? In the larger metropolitan areas near the hospitals. We don't have adequate resources on the farm and ranch. The number of mental health professionals needs to be increased in several ways by training local providers, the doctors, the nurses, school counselors, pastors, and extension, even our valued farm people. Yes? I'd like to ask a question about about the mental health, I'm still, I'm still on point number one here. 91% okay. um, of 
farmers and farm workers said financial issues and fear of losing their farm impact their mental health. Now, I lived in the city for about 30 years, and now I'm back home and back on, on the ranch. So I kind of I kind of see the city perspective, and now I'm reacquainting after being gone for so many years. I'm learning how farmers and ranchers think and what they're facing. And what I'm hearing is that, and this is really, it could sound political, but it's where they're at. I mean, they're afraid of losing their operation. They're yes. afraid of losing their cattle herd. And um, I got a letter recently, a copy of the letter that I could share with you, and you maybe have seen it too. It was from a producer who was saying how packers are controlling the cattle market. And I'm not gonna try and explain all of it, but packers, the packing industry controls the cattle market to the degree that they are making as much as $450 per carcass while cattle people are going broke. And foreign beef coming in is affecting prices and the trade and everything. And then there's this issue, again, I'm hearing from these guys, the beef checkoff money is controlled by the packers. And so I learned about this, and I called my representative. To, yes, okay, here we go. And I called my representative and my senators and said, I'm hearing this is a real problem. You know, what can we do to change this around? We've got to have country of origin labeling. That seems like that would, these guys are telling me, we need, you know, they wish country of origin labeling instead. And when I call the offices, they go, gosh, you know, we really can't do anything about that. That's controlled by some, it's kind of like I have the bug goes around. So anyway, farmers and these guys are maybe losing their operation, feel like they're between a rock and a hard spot. And, and then we're hearing that, oh, we want to help you with your mental health. And we'll get more money to help you with your mental health, but we can <coughs> fix the root problem. You're right about that. It was what we heard a great deal at Farm Aid. Uh, we know that uh, it does take real solutions to income to ease the stress. Policies have to be changed. And I don't want to get too much into that because I want to concentrate on behavioral well-being. But I don't want to ignore it because it is, in many ways, the key. Yeah. This year, particularly, uh, just to advance a little bit of that, your point, we lost a million calves due to weather. Uh, some were uh, little calves where their mommies had, mothers had taken them down to the timber along streams so that they could calve there. And uh, the little calves were born and couldn't get out of the way of the rising water. We had more dummy calf syndrome this year than what we've had for a long time. We don't know the full contributors to dummy calf. For those of you who don't know what that is, it is when a calf looks entirely decent at birth, but can't stand up. Um, it often has uh, inability to nurse, and we try very hard to keep it going by uh, putting a tube down into the stomach keeping it warm because it can't regulate its temperature very well, and we can only save about 10% of them. We don't know the full story of what's causing that. We also have the problem this year of too much rain that has affected cropping. Uh, I nearly had to stop on I-80 yesterday over by uh, Mitchell, where the water was so high it had, uh, was washing over the uh, interstate, but uh, I understood that it was worse uh, the day before. But we have, we have to have solutions that are meaningful. The supplemental payments haven't done the job. Farmers and ranchers feel and tell me that they feel like 
Their loyalty is being purchased. They're farming for the government. They don't take good stock in, we're from the government and we're here to help. They want to produce and to be paid fairly for their efforts, not supplemented so that they vote in a particular way. I think I will let that go for now and talk more about behavioral health because we all have our own opinions about this matter and the solutions and it's a topic that isn't going to go away quickly but one that needs constant address and solutions. To bring us back to this Farm Bureau poll, most people said that the, num the rural residents would like to see the, their providers trained better in their culture and in their stressors and their solutions. So good counselors need to understand the culture of agricultural producers. The word agriculture has two stems, agra and culture. The agra part is important to agronomists and to farmers. The culture part is maybe even more important. So important that we understand the behaviors of agricultural producers to the point that we integrate behavioral training into agricultural curricula. We need to see that integrated into the training of extension. People who are getting degrees at South Dakota State in ag, in our community colleges in agriculture, even in vocational ag in high schools, and in FFA and 4-H. I think the time is coming when we will focus as much on behavior as on physical health and zoonotic illnesses that can be transferred between animals and humans. Let me go now to how our bodies react to stress. So I'm gonna shift gears just a little. Many of you are familiar with stress and what it does to you. First, we appraise if a situation is threatening. So does a cow when she's going up the chute. She's looking to see if there's a way out ahead of her. Is there a loud noise up ahead? Are there, is there a combination of light and dark coming through the walls of the chute that looks unfamiliar and is threatening? So she is appraising whether to go into that chute. She can do several things. She can fight the threat by balking and refusing to go into the chute. She can take flight from the threat by running through so fast that we don't catch her in the head catcher. Or she can freeze. Not very many cows freeze. Possums do that. We humans do that. We take flight when we feel threatened by not talking to the lender, by withdrawing from social activities of church and 4-H and school. Or we fight the threat by saying, I'm getting an attorney to deal with this one. Or we threaten people with if you take my land away from me, I'm going to end it all, and you might be one also to go. Yes, I have talked to many people who have seen individuals end their lives in the lending office to make a point. Or we, I have seen people freeze to the point that they can't crawl into the combine or the truck cab, because they are so emotionally paralyzed they can't get up and go about the activities needed to complete the day's work. When we appraise the threat and feel it is threatening, our muscles tense, 
Our heart rate increases to push blood around to our muscles. Our blood pressure increases. Our pupils dilate to take in more information. Our senses sharpen. If no further threat occurs, our nervous system is able to resume production of healthy bodily chemicals like serotonin, which gives us a sense of well-being, serotonin, serotonin, norepinephrine. That is why antidepressant medications usually combine serotonin and norepinephrine or have at least one of those ingredients in their formulation. These are essential body hormones that make us feel healthy and well and able to laugh. Oxytocin is secreted when the cow lets down her milk, when we laugh heartily, when we're relaxed. So if there are no further threats, then we secrete cortisol, Our bodies recuperate from the stress of muscle tension, rapid heart rate. We start to relax. We say, whew, that was close. I'm sure glad that's over. The cow says after she's had her shots or after she's been AI'd, whew, I'm glad that was over. That reminds me of another story. I AI'd all of our cows that we AI'd. That was not artificial intelligence, by the way. <laughs> but when I was in a hurry, and I got the cow in at 6.30 in the morning and I needed to get the job done of inseminating her, uh, I in or, so I could still get time to go in, change clothes, take a shower, and get to work by quarter to eight at least. That is when I was doing my professional counseling. As I was trying to find the cervix with my left arm up the cow's rectum, and I was uptight, she had spasms and was trying to force me to withdraw my hand and arm. When I said, Mike, calm down. Take your time. Just relax. As I relaxed, the cow sensed it, just like dogs sense it when we relax. So I got the job done. The tail goes up and says, Mike, you hit the spot. So I know that when I am relaxed, my cow's relaxed. We took care of each other. So we need these times when cortisol prepares us for the next episode when we need to get tensed up again because there's a threat. But when the threats come regularly like they did for Chris, he didn't get a chance to relax. He couldn't sleep. We find sleep deprivation to be a prime procreator or antecedent to ending one's life or attempting to end one's life. So if you are thinking dreadful thoughts, you don't get a chance to respond with cortisol production and to relax and to finally rest. But instead you're geared up constantly. To some extent, the use of medications can help, but we need to know what medications and when to use them. I have or had a client whose husband ended his life. He called me on Thursday afternoon, driving to see his family physician. His lender said to him, you need to get medication because you've gone now for two nights without resting. He took that recommendation to heart, called his wife and said, honey, I'm going to see our doctor. 
Then he called me while en route and said, the lender said I need to talk to you. And I said, what's going on? He told me, I can't sleep. I said, I hope you're on your way to the doctor's office. He said, yes. I said, while we talk, would you please pull off the road? And he made some notes. He put down my telephone number. And he went to see his physician who gave him a medication that included serotonin, not knowing that it was planting season and that this man was stirring the seeds in his soybean boxes on the planter to level them off, but he wasn't using rubber gloves. The seed coating was getting in through his skin into his body system. The toxic substance works like this. We have a nervous system with two cells separated by a space called the synapse. In that space are a number of fluids. They include acetylcholine, which transfers the message from one cell to the next cell instantaneously, so fast that a nerve signal can go through many of these nerve cells and passage over synapses from our brain to our toe and back in the span of less than one-tenth of a second as little as one hundredth of a second in prime athletes with very sound, rapid reflexes. This particular chemical blocks the acetylcholinesterase, which breaks down the acetylcholine in the synapse. Acetylcholinesterase takes the acetylcholine, metabolizes it, and then it, the next time the nerve cell fires, acetylcholine is released into the synapse and the message goes from one cell to the next. Serotonin is an upper. It worsens the condition of already being hyper alert. Insects get the toxin into their system when bees visit sunflowers that have been sprayed with organophosphate insecticide or clover that's been sprayed to get rid of aphids. When the bee goes back to the hive with some nectar and pollen, it is delirious by the time it gets to the hive. That's both good and bad. It's good in that the hive mates don't know where to go for additional nectar unless they find it on their own. But it's bad in that the hive doesn't get enough nutrition and the bees experience bee colony collapse, which we know is somehow correlated, but we don't fully understand how it results in the death of the colony. But we do know that it has become unacceptable to collect information on the number of beehives in our country because it might show some light on what is happening to our bee populations. How awful. I better be careful to not go into this politics anymore. Okay, thank you. The exposure to toxins in this farmer who was planting his soybeans was keying him up and serotonin worsened the condition. He didn't know that, neither did the physician. The physician had not taken a course called agricultural medicine. It's a course taught in 14 medical schools around the country. It teaches physicians how to detect frequent illnesses and injuries that farmers experience in the pulmonary system, just like Willie at Farm Aid has, probably has COPD. He performed, but he was not as accurate as he used to be. He was always taking a pause. <gasps> <sighs> 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 
but he's 86. And he got through his set. Anyhow, the human body tries to get rid of the toxins by frequent urination, by tear flowing, tears flowing, by mucus flow, by uh, diarrhea, even vomiting. But it can't get rid of all of it because it attaches to our fat cells. So every time we are exposed to the same toxin, we're accumulating more and building up a greater amount in our bodies. And that is what was happening with this man. And the physician didn't know that his treatment was worsening it. It is why we need people to have proper training to understand the culture of agricultural producers. It is why we need the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network to now set up four regional centers around the country. Each center is designed to provide technical assistance to local resources that want to do something to address farming issues and to make farming safer. There will be a center in the Northeast, the South, the Midwest, and the West. The call for proposals was due on July 27. The awards have been made, but I don't know the successful applicants. I know many of the unsuccessful applicants, but I have not seen a press release that indicates where these four centers will be. We need these four centers for agricultural behavioral health. We also need the best practices that came from our research over 15 years and from our research during the farm crisis era of the 1980s. At any rate, what we know is that when we are stressed, we try to find relief. What are the most common behavioral problems of the agricultural population. Can I ask a yes. When you talk about meditation for producers, yes. Um, there's so much to say. I hope I have enough time in our two days. It's all right. I'll answer, I'm going to answer your question because it's important. What are the medications that can be used? Uh, the medications that would have helped this gentleman were probably the anti-anxiety meds in the diazepam family like Valium, uh, Xanax, uh, other medications that curtail the buildup of anxiety because that's what happens when we go through a threatening circumstance. First, we become alarmed. That alarm phase keys us up to do something. If we do, don't calm down, we eventually deplete ourselves of, well, of uh, serotonin and norepinephrine and oxytocin. Cows that are stressed don't give as much milk. Nor do animals in the feedlot grow as fast when they're stressed. Nor do we sleep well. So we know that after we have become alarmed, we must manage that alarm. We have to recognize it. But did you know that farmers are prone to overreacting to stress? Those of us who have Germanic ancestry carry in us a predisposition that I like to call the Teutonic gene. Teutons inhabited Central Europe until they were pushed into the Nordic countries, into Great Britain, into Eastern 
uh, Europe as barbarians filtered into Central Europe after the Holy Roman after the Roman Empire during the era of the Holy Roman Empire. So it was in the Middle Ages. This tendency to overreact makes us good farmers because we're always on the lookout for threats and to deal with them. But it sets us up to eventually deplete ourselves of serotonin, norepinephrine, oxytocin, and we become tired, fatigued, and cortisol makes us a little bit fat because we're preparing our bodies for the next onslaught of stress. So we do need to know that anxiety almost always precedes depression. So it was anxiety that was an uncertainty that was killing farm people and is killing farm people. But we need to know what to do about that and we need to train people to differentially recognize depression versus a toxic reaction to certain farm chemicals. So that is the kind of training that comes from agricultural medicine courses which cover all the human body systems, pulmonary, cardiovascular, uh, muscular, skeletal, behavioral. I often teach the behavioral section. But the course is taught in medical schools so that eventually they develop their own cadre of persons who will carry on this course. There are six textbooks in agricultural medicine. There is none in agricultural behavioral health. I had an hour and a half to cover behavioral health in a 40-hour course. We need whole courses. That's why we need these centers and that's why the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network is a valuable step in the right direction. Not a complete step, but it's a start. We need a whole education system that trains providers to serve the behavioral well-being of agricultural producers. What are the kinds of behavioral health issues that we experience? The first and most common reason that people called our hotlines, we started in 2000, or 1998. If you remember 1998, it was a time when pork prices dropped to eight cents a pound one afternoon in September. Wow, that is low. There was worry in Congress and in the federal administration, that time it was the Clinton administration, that we could be heading into another crisis in agriculture like we had in the 80s. Let's see if we can forestall it. They gave $4 million to the Wisconsin Office of Rural Health and the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association, which brought together representatives from seven states. Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, and Iowa. It became clear that Wisconsin entities could not continue the program because their main duties were to serve the people of Wisconsin. So the leaders from these seven states formed a consortium called Agro Wellness, which became a nonprofit corporation in Iowa. I was their director, and still am their director. Jim Kenyon from Rapid City was on our board for quite a while. The work that we did was to look at why people called hotlines and helplines, what worked to diminish stress on the farms and ranches. We found several common denominators from our work in the 1980s and our work in the 2000s, because agro-wellness went from 2001 until 2015, approximately. 
We found in the 1980s that the loss of the farm was the greatest stressor equal to the death of a child. We found that same stressor still in the 2000s. We found that the loss of the land was the most potent, and I'll have to say more about why that is uh, probably tomorrow. Remind me to talk about the agrarian imperative, that's another theory. Remind me also to talk about the ADHD tendency that exists among farmers and ranchers. Yes, there is an upside to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Makes us good farmers and ranchers. The behavior Ill reason why people called our hotlines, first and foremost, was to say there's something wrong in our relationship. He won't talk to me. She spends all the money I always in town. If I could just get her to keep the money in her purse, it would be a whole lot better. No, we need you at home, son. You can't play football this fall. We can't afford a hired hand to help haul the grain. We need you. It's complaints about the marriage, about relationships and stress that are the first and foremost reason why people seek help. So relationship problems is the most common symptom of behavioral distress in a farm family. Second was adjustment problems. For those of you who know the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, everybody gets the diagnosis. Those diagnoses, by the way, go to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which collects every insurance form that is submitted around the country. They tabulate these data to keep track of how many people have depression, how many people have gallstones, how many people have uh, diabetes, and so forth. Essential information. The trouble is, though, that insurers have access to the center for, or called CMS, and they can see that depression is a precipitant to suicide. So they raise the premium for life insurance or before the Affordable Care Act, they put riders on conditions like depression, the very thing for which insurance was needed. So we have to address the whole issue of insurance or maybe not even filing an insurance claim. So the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network does make it possible for people to receive counseling or medication management without an insurance claim. It operates like an employee assistance plan. And that's the way Agro Wellness operated in our seven states. We found that our best practices included hotlines and helplines, counselors who were trained in agricultural behavioral health. You had to have 24-7 availability of these hotlines and helplines, and you have to provide counseling when farmers and ranchers need it and can access it. That means weekends, evenings, we found that community workshops greatly benefit the whole rural environment, not just farmers and ranchers, but bringing together business people with agricultural producers generates solutions to the community-wide problems because farm income turns over as many as six times in our local communities before it's finally expended. So we learned these things, which I'll say more about tomorrow. But I wanted to now finish what are the most common illnesses and reasons why people called the hotlines. We looked at 43,852 callers from September 2005 through October 2007. Those 43,852 people, first and foremost, complained of relationship problems, followed by adjustment problems with too much anxiety or too much depression. 
Third was anxiety disorders. So the buildup of alarm with too many threats going at one time. We can handle two, but we can't handle three. After anxiety, because of what I explained in the general adaptation syndrome, depression follows. And that is our contributor to this nefarious problem of suicide. What we don't see much in the agricultural population is substance misuse as a primary diagnosis. Surprise! But it accompanies depression or anxiety in almost half the cases. So it is a co-occurring diagnosis in about 40 to 50 percent of distressed farmers and ranchers who seek help. But people drink to escape thinking. People use methamphetamines to keep operating the combine. People use opioids so they don't feel the pain physically and sometimes psychologically. So we do have to pay attention to substance misuse. What we don't see in the agricultural population are high rates of personality disorders. They are too incapacitating. We don't see high rates of psychotic illnesses with uh, delusions or hallucinations, command uh, messages saying, kill this person because he is taking your farm away, or something like that. So psychoses have been sorted out in all farm and ranch populations except the Hutterites, Mennonites, and Amish because these are communities where they take care of one another and they take care of the chores when someone is disabled. It's a better farm program than our USDA. So we do see some problems with psychotic illnesses in these uh, highly religious communities. But we don't see people in farming and ranching with a lot of chronic behavioral health problems except the genetic predisposition to depression and the tendency to ADHD. I'll cover that just here in a minute. ADHD was first discovered among Kenyan sheep herders and cattle uh, drovers in the country of Kenya in Africa. The work was done by Dan Eisenberg of Northwestern University at that time. He's now at the University of Washington. He noticed that the most successful farmers in Kenya with the most goats, sheep, and cows tended to be hyper alert. They didn't need much sleep. They were always on the lookout for green pastures. They were on the lookout for predators like lions. And when they examined their genetic structure, he found that they had four times the incidence of ADHD of less successful sheep herders and cattle herders. We now know that ADHD runs in farmers throughout the entire world. Whereas the Germanic Teutonic gene occurs mostly in Germanic people, you do find it in others of different heritage as well, because not just Germans get depressed. You can find depression even in happy-go-lucky people, in Hispanic, Latino people, people of color, but we always see this tendency to have ADHD in the agricultural population and the tendency for depression. That then sets us up for this high rate of suicide. How am I doing for time? Am I there? Okay. So we'll have to conclude this morning. I'm going to hang around uh, for the entire day and be here this evening uh, and all uh, tomorrow until we have to head back to Iowa after lunch. So I'll have some books out there. I'm not trying to sell you the books. You choose if you want 
It is uh, a book that has done quite well, but uh, uh, I'm selling it instead of the book, uh, the listed price. You can have it for $15, and if you don't have $15 on you, I'll take 10. If you don't have 10, I'll take five. So don't let that money issue bother you. I'd like you to have the book. It's a series of stories about farming and behavioral health and fly fishing of all things. So thank you very much for your attention and more later.